Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all? Groaning, it is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Oh, it is. Is it good that we remind ourselves?
session meeting, please join us by Zoom because we have a number of important things on the agenda. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Thursday night, 7 o'clock, is the Bible study continuing with Timothy, uh, first and second. We are well into second Timothy now, so Rinda will send you an invitation if you have not yet received one. There are two other very important things Rinda is doing and we are doing as a church. We know September is right around the corner, and we are trying to, to estimate and to plan for the best possible Christian education program. There is a survey that has gone out on my church, and you can respond to that so we can, can develop something that will be to your liking. And also, we, as we have students going away, some to, to college and universities, and even in our midst here, who are uh, college age students, we are proposing to offer prayer partners for them. So if you would like to be a prayer partner, praying for a particular youth of this congregation and uh, all children, all ages, all children, little ones too, all children. So please sign up through um, Rinda with uh, that email and invitation. I believe we are ready for more music to lead us into worship. It is my great pleasure to say that we gather here this morning to let God's love awaken us. Let's stand and sing one of our favorite songs. <laughs> Stronger, your love awakens, awakens. 
Join me as we recognize God's worship a place in this worship. Oh, give thanks to the name of the Lord. Let us sing praises that tell of his wonderful works. Proclaim the name of Yahweh in all its glory. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Good morning to all children of all ages. I may need some help from the congregation members this morning because I have no children in my playground. I had an unusual thing happen this week. I went to the grocery store, and when I got home, I had an email from a colleague at another church who says, were you just at Harris Teeter? And I wrote back and said, yes. And she said, I saw you, but you had your mask on, and I wasn't sure it was you, and I didn't speak, and I should have spoken, and I apologize. And I told her not to worry because I didn't notice her either. So I'm sometimes finding, questioning whether I can recognize people in mask because we don't know, um, you know, we just get used to the whole face and just seeing the eye makes a little difference. So I got to thinking, I wondered if you recognized some of your favorite cartoon characters if they had masks on. So let's see if you do. Okay, number one, Snoopy. Okay, you're good. Mickey Mouse. Not to be undone. Minnie Mouse. Okay. One more cartoon. Winnie the Pooh, who looks quite comfortable. Spider-Man, okay, that which proves that our superheroes need to wear masks, too. 
So I got to thinking about our passage today, because sometimes we recognize people by their faces. Sometimes we can recognize a person by their smell, maybe a special perfume that mom wears, so when she walks in the door, you know she's there. Or maybe there's a family member who's always humming, and you know when they're coming. But one day Jesus said to his disciples, who he was standing right in front of, and he says, who do people say I am? And Peter immediately said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter recognized Jesus not only by his face because he was standing there, but he knew in his heart who Jesus was. He recognized that this was God's son who was living among them and that God had given him the ability to know this. And so we call this Peter's great confession because he was able to say without a doubt that he knew that he was the living Messiah, the one that had been promised to them for generations who was now in their midst, and he was the son of God. So that was how Peter recognized Jesus, and that's how we recognize Jesus, through our heart, what we know about Christ in our hearts. So help us remember each day that that is what we want to remember about Jesus, is that he dwells within us. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we do thank you for the presence of Christ, the presence of your spirit in within us. Help us each day to hear its voice, to hear him calling to us, and to act accordingly. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sing along with us. You can just stay seated, and, but sing. Sing to our great Messiah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah.
blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescued for sin. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful word and message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Our prayer of thanksgiving comes from one of the young adult volunteers who has served two years in various places, and let us share together her prayer and ours. Creator God, you have crafted each of us for a purpose, with a plan in mind that will change the world and influence us to struggle, learn, and grow. Just as you sent prophets, Samaritans, and the Messiah to us, you have sent strangers and friends to let us know we are not alone. You have commanded one thing, to love one another. As we struggle to find ourselves and to reshape this broken world, help us to remember that we are not alone. United in faith, a family of love, forgiveness, and grace. Amen.
Thank you, Jordan. We have this story today from the beginning of Matthew's chapter 16. And we know that Peter is one character that is always out there. You never have to wonder about what he's feeling, thinking, or doing. And today we have a wonderful story of Peter being out there declaring who God is. And the rest of chapter 16 will be our theme for next week. It will bookend for us Peter's confidence today and a different kind of confidence next week. So for now, hear this word from the Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But Jesus said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. A word from the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now, O Lord, may all the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I appreciate that Jesus offers the disciples something of a warm-up question to prompt their thinking about his identity. My dear friends and followers, what do you hear on the streets about who people believe I am? Be honest, what are they saying? Oh, that's easy, Jesus. You measure up with the greatest, like John the Baptist, Elijah, or even Jeremiah. Okay, says Jesus, you're on the right track. But who do you say that I am? The disciples and we can always attest to something we've heard. I plan to draw on some reflections from others just to get us thinking like Jesus invited the disciples to do. But as we work through a few suggestions, see what fits for you or what you might choose to discard. Because the intro is to get us warmed up. Get ready, though, for the question that Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Two of my favorite theologians offer a similar critique about how Peter's knowing who Jesus is actually has a profound effect on who Peter is, what Peter does, what Peter believes. Jill Duffield from the Presbyterian Outlook wrote, Outlook wrote, not only does Peter name correctly who Jesus is, the Christ, the Son of the living God. But Jesus then tells Peter who he truly is. You are Peter, the rock upon whom I will build my church. There is a mutual revealing of true identity when we come to confess who our Lord is. 
While we can never know God fully, given our human limitations, and while we change and grow, Jesus' lordship remains constant. Jesus is ever and always the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Naming, knowing, and clinging to this proclamation allows God to reveal to us throughout our lifetime and in every situation who we are, to whom we belong, how we practice the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When our relationship to God is clear, our other priorities all become more rightly ordered. Also, you know that I have felt a little bit spoiled this month in looking to Barbara Brown Taylor's exclamations and comments on Matthew, but her interpretation today offers the perfect balance for the often big challenges on our journey. In her book, The Seeds of Heaven, she says, if Peter is the rock upon which the church is built, then there is hope for all of us. Peter remains God's chosen rock, whether he is acting like the cornerstone or a stumbling block and shows us that blessedness is less about perfection than about willingness. willingness. It is what counts when we risk our own answers, when we go ahead and try, because we can get up again after we fall. But that process of learning and growing and evolving who we need to be means we will make mistakes. Like Peter, like some of the apostles, like I make all the time, and sometimes you too. But that sense of learning is how God moves through us to lead us to a different era. God works through us to take us forward. And so in that understanding, we wonder who we might claim Jesus is for us today. This term that Peter used is that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who has come to redeem the world. And we know in that Roman culture, the anointed one, the heir of David, the heir of those who sat on the throne of the kingdom of Israel, are in absolute confrontation with the emperor of Rome. That is why Rome felt threatened. Jesus is being looked at as the anointed one, the one coming to bring a new kingdom, to issue forth and usher in equality and understanding, forgiveness and a sense of power for every single person. And that is a threat to the church, to the emperor, and to the established way of life in Jesus' day. But he is the Messiah. Another term that we know is used for Jesus as soon as he is born is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God walking alongside of us, carrying us, moving through us to bring us to understanding of that amazing passage in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that God gave us the person, the incarnate God, Jesus Christ so that we don't hear about what it's like to live like Jesus. We see it. We are called to do it. We are invited to be that person whom Jesus has become and who we are growing into being ourselves. 
God becomes human so that our enlightenment might be fulfilled. One other term, which actually completes that whole Trinitarian image of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, comes from Marcus Borg. Borg wrote in 1994, meeting Jesus again for the first time, the historic Jesus and the heart of contemporary faith. Borg talks about Messiah, incarnate Christ, and all of those, but then he brings another illustration. Jesus is a spirit person. Jesus is the mediator of the sacred. And Borg says this is not anything new for the Jewish culture. There have been mediators of the spirit since Abraham. There have been those who walk with Christ or walk with God as does Moses, who even sees the face of God in the burning bush and whose face glowed like the divine presence when he received the Ten Commandments. Jesus remembers from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he says, I have been called to bring and lift up those who are downtrodden. I have been called to release those who feel captive by orders and systems and rules and constraints. I am the one who gives life freely so that you might have it more abundant. This spirit, Jesus, is not anything new for us. This spirit, Jesus, is the one who lives in us and calls us to do things we didn't think we could accomplish. We know sometimes, looking around us, there is more happening to the good and for the benefit of people now than we have ever seen before. We are being those messengers. We are lifting those up like we are the angels of God sent to a hurting and broken world. Paul even understands this throughout his conversion experience and culminating life. On that road to Damascus, he sees the light and hears a voice and struggles throughout all of his letters writing to the church until he comes to the realization that th there is neither male nor female, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, but all, all are Jesus. We have no business holding people down, denying them fullness of life whenever we understand what God calls us to do. That is a challenge. That is hard. It is confrontational, but it is required of us. Who do you say Jesus is? What is your message for this community, this day, this world? I probably had some of the most profound experiences to see that in action when we first went abroad and lived for two years in Indonesia. Indonesia has in its constitution that everyone can practice religion. And there was one little church in this town of Bogor. Bogor has just under a million people population. And this church was a mission church built by the Baptist and used on Sundays by a Japanese, by an Indonesian Baptist church. It was used by an Indonesian Catholic church. And then it was used by a multilingual, diverse, many language speaking Christian church. And we were about 12 families that would worship every Sunday in the midst of that town that was always bustling with travelers and fragrances of all kinds of foods and burning garbage and shouts of people around because the windows in the church had no screens. You could 
see sometimes the rooster in the ledge that was telling us it was daytime. But in this church of these few families, everybody did everything. When they learned that there was a minister that was in the congregation, they asked me if I would be the preacher. I said, absolutely not, because I am enjoying the sermons from all of you who preach. I, I preached once a month, and the other Sundays of the month I taught Christian education that was from age three through sixth grade. Multilingual children, they did a lot of coloring but we had a good time together. I was never asked to lead music. We knew that was not my talent. But Mike and I also did the fellowship and took food on that fourth Sunday, whichever was our turn in the month. But we were people that were from the Netherlands and France, a family from Germany and one from Vietnam. There was only one other American family. There was only one other American family in the whole town. They were Methodist, but we were close friends. But realizing that there were many names for Christ and there were many ways of serving Jesus and that we were choosing to be a witness in that place and time, expanded not only my mind but my heart for all that God calls us to do. And the closing part of this scripture is that whatever you bind on earth will be bound for eternity and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed for eternity. And if that is not about forgiveness, I don't know what it is. The cornerstone of God's church is about forgiveness. The understanding that we will continue to make mistakes, but as our efforts to reform ourselves are changed, we will be closer to becoming whole. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed before the end of this hour. And when we say that line, we believe in the forgiveness of sins, we are not nearly as impacted by the forgiveness of sins we need to extend to others as we are by the forgiveness of sins we might need to extend to ourselves. Forgiveness is never complete unless we understand God's love is greater than our own sense of worthiness because we don't have it. Worthiness is not ours to claim. It belongs only to the Christ. But as we practice that incarnate love that comes to us through this Jesus Christ, we can stand up with full and able spirits. Who do you say he is? What is your story about what you believe and what you do about what you believe? Amen. Now I know that you knew this was coming, right? This is what the contemporary band calls the church's, FPC Monroe Church's favorite song. So we must stand and sing, here we go.
that joy, let us declare what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We declare what we believe so that we might unite in affirmation and confirmation. We remember who Jesus is for us so that we are strengthened and given new fortitude for the living of these days. 
and we pray together so that we realize to some extent, sometimes only a little and sometimes a great amount, the experiences of people that are having struggles and celebrations that are having heartache and who also have a sense of joy in their lives. We connect with all of that when we pray together. A number of things I want to mention and then we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. We have an expression of grief for Gloria Baker in the passing of her sister-in-law, Diane Hutchinson. We are also prayerful very much this morning for Greg McDaniel, that is, I'm sorry, for Jim McDaniel, who is Greg's brother. He had been improving so well with COVID, or having had COVID, and now um, has a very serious setback. So we will pray and do pray for Jim. We learned, it may have it's been a long time, that our sister Joyce Hannah has had pneumonia and she is in the Pruitt Rehabilitation Center. Unfortunately, she's on an inside room and we can't go and wave at her from the outside across the, through the window. But we will pray for her and she knows that. We have special prayers for the father of Steph, Stephanie uh, Ruggiero. Her dad, Tennis, had some emergency surgery last yesterday and is in recovery now and and doing as well as possible after some extensive surgery. So we pray for Tennis, Steph's dad, and her mother, Carol. We know that our Judith has been through her first week of treatment for the prevention of any further growth of her tumor that is gone, and so we pray for, for Judith and also her brother, Kirk. We surround the Hayes family, Alan and Carolyn and, Kirk and Kyle, who are struggling around strength and um, clarity for what to do in that family. And we rejoice with Dana in the celebration of her 25 years, but also continue to pray for her healing from the blood clot that she had and pray for Earl and for Lorraine, who is gaining strength and, re and living now at home. She is home. And for those that are expecting babies, Joe and Maggie in September, Holly and Caleb in January, <clears throat> and Andrew and Sarah in February, my daughter-in-law. Okay. Um, let us be aware of God's presence. humbled, dear Jesus, to know that you expect us to do what you do. We are struck and, and, and grateful by the grace you pour into our lives. We walk in faith, knowing that there are no problems we cannot face because you are on our side. And we walk in joy knowing that resurrection is our eternal life. For all that we experience in life and in death, we know you understand us fully. For all that we are able to do in your name, we know that you give us strength like a rock, the power of a waterfall, and absolute confidence that you are working through us. Keep us humble, keep us ready to forgive one another as we forgive ourselves. Keep us on a journey of learning, knowing that we have not understood you fully until we see you face to face. But we do see glimpses, oh God. We do know that you are right next to us, maybe not in body, but our sense of spirit, when we pray unceasingly with every breath, when we are aware of how close you are and how you are living through us, 
and we regain our confidence. We know that that evolution of our own doubt has been shattered, and we know again who you are. And for that confidence, we are thankful. And for that service that comes from doctors and nurses and teachers, for that sense of not only obligation, but desire to be the healing force of this nation and of this world, we give you thanks that you accompany us. We issue forth prayers for all the people on the west coast of California, knowing that thousands of acres, even a hundred thousand plus, have been destroyed by fire. People have had to leave their homes and watch everything go up in smoke. We know there are storms in the Gulf of Mexico as they inch closer or speed closer to the shores of Mississippi and Alabama and Texas. And for that kind of struggle we have in disaster of nature, we ask that you continue to empower us to be your angels, to work through the rubble of what falls apart and build back again when it is wise and when it is of utmost importance. Give us thinking power, O oh God, to be leaders in overcoming illnesses. Give us humility, dear Jesus, to understand that you will empower us as we let you lead and not think we know it ourselves. Give us that spirit presence, that Holy Spirit that moves through us and claims us that helps us issue forth the words of love and joy and of abundant life. Peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. And so in that name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
remind us to exit this way and go over to the fellowship hall and sign the, the surprise card for Dana, and also to stay quiet after the benediction until we have been released by the powers behind the computers. And now let us go out into this world, into this day, into this life in peace. Let us go with the understanding of the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Let us go knowing we are ambassadors of Almighty God and lovers of our brothers and sisters and accompaniers with the Holy Spirit along life's life path. In all these things, we are united in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.